Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today we're going to be installing one of these four kernel ROM switches for the Commodore 64 and putting it through its paces. Now if you haven't seen the previous video I went through how to build one of these things and also the reasons why I chose the particular kernels that are on here but you don't necessarily need to watch that if you've just ordered one of these from my Tindy store and just want to see how it works. As I mentioned these are based on BWAC switchless kernel switcher which was then adopted by Teeble to use a PIC microcontroller and the original Commodore Power LED and what I've done is basically shrunk this package down into something this size. So yeah obviously there is quite a bit of space saving going on and it roughly matches the other kernel ROM replacements that I've already done. So let's get this thing installed and see how it works. For this I am using the Australian Commodore 64 case but it does have a 250407 board inside. These are currently only compatible with the longboard Commodore 64s. I haven't started work on a short board one, but that may happen in the future. So on this board, the kernel ROM is already in a socket, which makes things a lot easier. In fact, if you've bought one of these off the Tindy store, then uh, if your kernel ROM is already in a socket, you don't actually need to solder anything. So that drops in like so, making sure you get the orientation correct on the IC. And then I've also included some little hook clips in my kit that I sell on the Tindy store, but you can also use just plain wires and solder them directly. These two connect to this R set or reset and RSTR, which is restore. And these hooks just clip onto the most convenient place to find those signals. On the 407 boards, they are on resistor R41 on the right hand side and resistor R36 on the right hand side. If you're wondering where to find these signals, an easy way to do it is just to grab a multimeter, set it to continuity, obviously have the machine powered off, and the third pin on the keyboard connector next to the notch is the restore line. So you can pretty much go around the board. And like I said, the right hand side of R41 also has the restore signal on it. So that is where we're going to connect our restore lead, which is the black one in this case. I'm just going to hook that over the edge of that resistor and that shouldn't be going anywhere. Like I said, you can directly solder these wires if you prefer. For the reset signal, the easiest place to find it is on pin 40 of the CPU, so the topmost right hand side. And like I said, that on this board goes to the right hand side of R36. But again, you can just run your lead around the board until you find the right spot. I'll get some images of where you can find all these signals on the various board revisions, but for this one, it is pretty straightforward. Now the other pins go to the power LED on the Commodore 64 case. However, with some boards, there is not enough length on the power LED cable to actually reach over to where the kernel ROM is. In this case, I'd suggest just using some male to female DuPont connectors and just plugging them straight into the power LED like so, and the other end into the kernel ROM. Just like that. And as with the original power LED connector on the C64 main board, the middle pin on this is negative. So you always want to make sure the middle pin is the same on both ends. Again, I'll be including this cable with the kits available on the Tindy store. And that is it. We can close this up. Or oh, better remember to reconnect the keyboard connector. Done. Let's bring over the disk drive and take this thing for a spin. Oh, and before we do that, we need to swap the kernel ROM in here over to Jiffy DOS as well. Again, the Jiffy DOS 1541 kernel is also available on my Tindy store, as is the other ROM replacement. And I'm just about to put up this little device ID board. This just sits under one of the vias, specifically the one at UC3 on the short boards or UAB1 on the long boards. And it just allows you to set the device ID, whether it be 8, 9, 10 or 11, with the use of either some jumpers on the side of the board or you can run these to little dip switches on the 1541 case. It's just a slightly easier way than cutting the device ID jumpers on the main board and soldering wires there. You can instead just connect them straight to these headers. Or you can just put little jumpers over them, but you'll just need to take off the lid anytime you actually want to switch device ID numbers. And let's be honest, if the 6522 is soldered directly to the main board, it may be easier just to cut those jumpers and solder wires there instead. All right, let's power on the drive. And when we power on the Commodore 64, you should notice the power LED flash a few times. And we're greeted with the regular Commodore 64 kernel. Now, holding the restore key will make the power LED flash once. And if we release it after that, that'll just do a machine reset. If you hold the restore key for longer though, so we get one flash and two flashes. 
that'll move us to the next kernel. And in this case, that's Jiffy DOS. You can then do the same thing. So one flash, two flashes, that'll take you to the next kernel, which is Jaffy DOS. And of course, one more time will take us to Exos. And doing it again will bring us back around to the original Commodore kernel. The other way to do this is to hold the restore key. And when you get to three flashes, that'll take you directly to the first kernel. So let's say I wanted to go to the fourth kernel, which would be Exos. We'd need to do one, two, three, four, five, six flashes. And that takes us straight to Exos or the fourth kernel in line. So there's probably not much point in looking at the original Commodore kernel. It is what it is. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, the reason I kept it on there is because it is the most compatible, being that everything was written to target it. And it also includes the tape loading routines, which the other kernels do not have. So really the only reason I'd use the original kernel these days is if I need cassette support or I'm having an issue loading a particular piece of software and I want to rule out that it's not the kernel causing the issue. Let's move over to Jiffy DOS. So this is Jiffy DOS, and I'm sure some of you are also familiar with this. And um, like I said, it removes the cassette loading routine. So if we try and load from cassette, it's actually going to try and load from the disk drive because it doesn't support loading from cassette. There are a number of other neat shortcuts. Let me get a floppy disk and we'll check some of them out. So for example, F1 will give us the disk directory. F3 will print a forward slash. This is a shortcut to load a basic program. So we can put, uh, say we, for instance, we want to load that 50 hertz demo. I can do forward slash 50 hertz star. And that will load that program into basic memory and then we can just run it. F5 prints an up arrow and that's pretty much the same thing except this will automatically run the program as well and F7 prints a percent sign, which is used to load and run a machine language program. Similar to what you do with load star comma eight comma one. GFDOS also includes a number of other shortcuts. Most of them begin with the at command. In fact, just printing at will give you the device ID error channel. If you've ever tried to look up the error channel using the original Commodore 64 basic, you'll probably know how much is required to type in just to get that little bit of information. I'm not going to go through all the shortcuts on GVDOS. Obviously, the main thing we want to look at is the loading speeds. So this does require GVDOS to also be installed in the disk drive. Alternatively, the SD to IEC does also include GVDOS routines and the Pi 1541 can support GVDOS, but you do need to purchase the GVDOS license file to stick on the Pi 1541. So let's have a look at our directory and we'll just load up the first program on the disk. So I'm just going to do a shift run stop. It was 146 blocks, which would normally take eh, probably a couple of minutes to load uh, with the original kernel. But there we are, already loaded. So yeah, Jiffy DOS speeds up loading by a factor of almost 10. Uh, I think the original kernel is about 400 bytes per second. Jiffy DOS is about 4,000 bytes per second but we can actually go faster than that, which is what we'll look at next with the Exos kernel, and then we'll come back and take a look at Jaffy DOS. So much like Jiffy DOS, this removes the cassette loading routine, so obviously doing a shift run stop, we'll just try and load star, and for whatever reason that failed. Oh, I know why that failed. Uh, Exos does not play nicely when you have Jiffy DOS enabled on the 1541 side. So I'm going to swap that over to the regular kernel for the 1541 drive and try that again. All right, here we go. And that is it. Once again, that was way faster than the original kernel routines. But uh, the biggest catch with Exos is it's not fully compatible with every program, especially ones that use their own fast loaders. Uh, that includes like a lot of modern demos as well. And um, yeah, it can sometimes fail loading multi-load programs. But the biggest benefit of Exos is that it just uses the original kernel inside the 1541. So you don't need a 1541 with Jiffy DOS. I've also done a bunch of tests using Exos with the SD to IEC and it appears to work well with the same amount of compatibility as you'd expect from the SD to IEC, which isn't a true 1541 drive emulator. 
As mentioned, Exos does have a bunch of things built into the F keys. I don't remember exactly what they are, but uh, you can slap around on them until you find one that you're looking for. And I think there are a few other shortcuts that use the control key and another key, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. One neat thing about Exos is you can actually break out of reset protective programs like 3D Pinball here. So if I were to do a regular reset, which we can do by holding the restore and waiting for the LED to flash once, you can see that the game is pretty much locked up because it is reset protected. But if we do a control and then a reset, that'll break us back out of the game. And that game is still in memory, so if I just hit restore now, we're back into the game again. So Exos can break you out of reset protected programs and cartridges. Uh, what you'd really do from there, I don't know, I'm not a hacker. Let's move over to Jaffy DOS. Now, as the name implies, it is very similar to Jiffy DOS, but one of the biggest benefits is having a built-in file browser for the SD to IC and Pi 1541. So I've currently got the SD to IC hooked up, and as you can see, uh, we don't have to load up any other file browser. We can just jump straight in and load the program of our choice. And of course, it does have those fast load routines that come with Jiffy DOS. Now, I haven't fully tested this out, but I believe the file browser also works with a regular 1541 disk drive. Uh, I don't have Jiffy DOS enabled on the drive at the moment, but let's just jump into Jaffy DOS, see what it does. Yeah, that does seem to work. But without Jiffy DOS enabled on the 1541 side, it is very slow. So I'm not going to sit around and wait for that to load. Now, as I mentioned in the last video, the function keys for Jaffy DOS are customizable. I pretty much set mine to the same as Jiffy DOS, so I don't have to remember two different sets of function key shortcuts. The main difference I changed was F7 to launch the file browser. So to summarize, I use the original Commodore kernel when I need cassette support, or I need full compatibility with all software. I usually use Jiffy DOS if I have a 1541 with Jiffy DOS in it in which case the loading speeds are about 10 times as fast. I use Jaffy DOS with the SD to IEC and the Pi 1541, but I guess you can also use it with a regular 1541 if you wanted to. And again, the speed improvement is about a factor of 10, same as Jiffy DOS. And finally, I'll use Exos when I have a disk drive that doesn't have Jiffy DOS inside of it. And uh, loading speeds are increased by a factor of about 11, uh, but compatibility is certainly lowered compared to Jiffy DOS and definitely lowered compared to the original Commodore ROM. So like I mentioned, these will be available on my Tindy store and I'll have images to where to install these on the different Commodore 64 board revisions. And uh, I'll also have, you know, the various other ROM replacements and the drive select switcher if you're interested in that. And um, yeah, I think that is about it. Of course, if you want to build your own version of this, uh, have a look at the previous video and all the files are available on the GitHub page. So I guess that is it for this one. A massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same, links to that are down in the video description. You'll get ad-free early access to all videos. I usually put them out about a week early for patrons. And uh, I also post a lot of little updates on the upcoming projects that I'm working on. So please consider that if you're interested. Uh, apart from that, thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff. Uh, be sure to leave a comment if you like. And um, yeah, I will catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye.